Hey everyone, today we are going to continue our conversation about basic economic concepts by looking at the concept of unemployment. And more specifically, we'll draw a distinction between those who are considered unemployed and those who are not working but not considered unemployed. And we'll talk about how to measure the unemployment rate. And we'll look more specifically at different types of unemployment that exist. So first off, what does it mean to be employed? Well, to be employed means that you're working, either full-time or part-time. It doesn't matter whether you have a full-time job or not. The question is, are you being paid for any amount of work that you're doing? And if you're getting paid, then you're considered to be employed. That doesn't necessarily mean that people are doing the jobs they want or that they're well used. It just means that they are employed. There is a certain segment of the population that we consider underemployed because they're either only working part-time or they're not using their skills to their fullest um, extent possible. And these people would like to work more meaningful jobs and work longer hours. It's just not available to them right now. So just because you're employed doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. It just means you're not unemployed. What does it mean to be unemployed? Well, it means that you not only don't have a job, but there are some additional qualifications you have to meet. Not only are you not working a job, but you have to be available to start working and you have to be looking in the last four weeks. So students who are over the age of 16 are considered in this, this measure of being unemployed, but only if you're actually trying to get a job. For many students at 16 or 17 years of age, you don't want a job. You're not looking to find a job. You're just going to focus on school, in which case we don't consider you to be unemployed. Um, whereas somebody who is actively searching for a job and not getting hired, they would be considered unemployed. In fact, if you're not looking for work, you fall under a category called not in the labor force, which we'll talk about here in just a second. So some people who don't work are not considered unemployed. One category of that is what we call discouraged workers. Those are people that would like to work. They have looked for work. They just can't find anything. And at some point, they just give up looking entirely, in which case, while they're not working, we don't consider them unemployed for the purposes of calculating the unemployment rate because uh, they are no longer part of what we call the labor force. Other people that aren't considered part of the labor force are anyone uh, who voluntarily leaves work and doesn't want to come back. So retirees, for example, are, part of, are not part of the labor force because while they could work, they don't want to. It's the whole point of retirement. And then we have this other group of people we call marginally attached workers. And those are, are people that are like the discouraged workers. They've looked, they can't find something, they've given up. But unlike discouraged workers, they haven't given up entirely. They're just post, postponing their job search for a short period of time, and then they'll try again in a little bit. Whereas discouraged workers have no intention of coming back anytime soon. And we measure the size of the labor force because it's an interesting and important number to see about the health of your economy. Obviously, the, the more people involved in the labor force, the the more active your economy is. So we can measure the labor force as the percentage of people who are considered to be employed and unemployed as a percentage of the entire population of people over the age of 16. And so in this example, we can see that in this sample economy, 61% of all of the people over the age of 16 are employed, 2% of the people over the age of 16 are unemployed, and 37% of those people are just not looking for work, are not part of the labor force. They've either retired, they're a stay-at-home parent, they're a student, um, or they've become discouraged and have given up looking for work. If we were going to calculate the number, we would say the, the number of employed people plus the number of unemployed people divided by the overall population would tell us what the labor force participation rate is. And so if we looked at some sample data, we could say that in a world in which there are 250,000 people over the age of 16, 125,000 people are employed, 25,000 people are unemployed. So we would take that employed plus unemployed number and divide it by the overall population. And in this case, we see that there's a 60% labor force participation rate. 40% of the population over the age of 16 is either discouraged, marginally attached, retired, a student, a stay-at-home parent, or doing something else anything else really, but looking for work. The unemployment rate, which is the more common number that you see in the news, is measuring 
what percentage of people who are looking for or participating in the labor market are out of work? And so in this example, we can see that 4% of the population that is looking for work uh, or is interested in, in working is unemployed. And 96% of people who are interested in getting a job have found something to do. So if we're going to calculate the unemployment rate, we would take the number of people unemployed and divide it by the labor force. So divided by the number of people who are unemployed plus those who are employed, either full or part time. It doesn't matter. As long as you have a job, you're employed. And we'll multiply by 100 to get the percentage rate. So in this sample data, we'd see 125,000 people are employed, 25,000 people are unemployed. So there are 150,000 people in our overall labor force, 25,000 of whom are out of work. So we see in this example that 16.67% of people who would like to work cannot yet find a job. Be careful, though, as you interpret the numbers, because sometimes in the news you'll see that the unemployment rate is going up, and you would think that that's a bad sign because that would mean more people are out of work. However, it doesn't always mean it's bad. It could be good because we might have people that are called the discouraged workers entering back into the labor force. We could see that people who thought they'd never be able to find a job are now actively looking because the state of the economy has restored hope in their minds that they'll be able to get work. So if we look at April 2022 as an example, and these are made up numbers, but if we have a population of 156,000 people over the age of 16. We have 4,000 unemployed workers, 2,000 discouraged workers. That comes out to an unemployment rate of 2.5%. But if those discouraged workers, if a thousand of them decide to start looking for work and haven't found any work yet, then we would see that the labor force increased by a thousand people. Um, and, and as a result, there's more unemployed people than before. And so the unemployment rate jumps to 3.1%. But it's not bad because a thousand people have some reason to think they may be able to find work, whereas before they didn't have any hope at all. So there's an indication there that there's economic activity or a possibly a, a, a more positive short-term future, which is drawing people back into the labor force. So rising unemployment rates can be good. Similarly, falling unemployment rates may be bad. If people give up work because they feel like the future is going to be terrible and they're never going to be able to find uh, work in, in the near future, and so they become discouraged and quit looking, then we would see the labor force would shrink and so the number of people who are unemployed um, could get smaller, which would drive the unemployment rate down. But that's bad news when you think that people have given up any hope of being able to find a job. So you've got to be sort of careful and pay attention to the news to understand how to interpret changes in the unemployment rate. Now, when it comes to types of unemployment, there are three different types or categories that unemployed people fall into, either frictional, structural, or cyclical unemployment. Frictional unemployment tends to be short-term in nature. It's, it's like rubbing your hands together very quickly. You create heat through friction, and it's because you're moving so fast with your, your hands. The same thing with unemployment, it's pe frictional unemployment. People are moving from one job to another, and so they're unemployed for the short term as they quickly switch to something new. Um, it could be that you're a recent college graduate, and now you are looking for work, and it's going to take a week or two to go through some interviews, but eventually you're going to get a job. Well, in between when you graduate and when you find your job, you are unemployed, but it's short-term in nature. Or maybe you're, you're changing uh, cities. You're moving from one city to the next, and you're going to go find another job when you get there. It's a short-term kind of thing. And because it's short-term and because people do this all the time, we're going to have an unemployment rate that is always above 0%. So you know, there will always be people who are, at least in the short term, without work, but looking for work because of this frictional nature of unemployment. You will also always have people who are structurally unemployed. Structurally unemployed people are those who have skills that the job market just no longer needs or wants. It could be because of a change in the demand for the goods or the technology that's being used in the job that they're doing. And so anytime your skills are replaced with some new product, you become structurally unemployed. So for example, there were people who made a living um, repairing typewriters, but nobody uses typewriters anymore. So your technical skill and knowledge and how to fix them 
is entirely meaningless in a world of computers. So you have become structurally unemployed because the nature of the employment market has changed. And again, there will always be people who are structurally unemployed. That's a good thing because it means there's technological advances and there are changes that presumably are a positive for the overall um, economy. So you will always see people who are being uh, made obsolete by changes in technology and their, their job then is to get new skills to be able to get work again. Um, and so you always have frictional, you always have structural unemployment. What you don't always have is cyclical unemployment. Cyclical unemployment has to do with the business cycle and the recognition that the economy grows and shrinks, and grows and shrinks, and grows and shrinks. And as the economy grows and reaches its peak, you're in a period of expansion where there's an increase in the demand for labor and we see unemployment typically goes down. And then as you enter into recession and head towards sort of the trough, the bottoming out of the economy, that's when we see a decrease in demand and we'll see a rise in unemployment. And so there's this natural wave of economic growth and recession, growth and recession that occurs. And so when unemployment is caused by either this growth or recession in the economy, that's something different. That's sort of unnatural in its nature. Um, and so there are people who are cyclically unemployed because the economy is shrinking. And that's, that's not good news. We don't want to see cyclical unemployment because it means they have the skills and the knowledge to do a job. It's just that that job is not in demand right now due to a shrinking economy. So we're gonna go through a couple of examples to see if you understand how to differentiate between these types. So I'll read out an example and you can press pause, make your guess, and then press play again and see if you're right. So the first person, you finished college and earned a bachelor's degree in public administration. You have applied for several jobs and are waiting to hear back. So what type of unemployment are you representing? In this case, you would be representing frictional unemployment. It's short-term in nature. You're shifting between jobs. Presumably, after you've just finished college, you've got the skills that the labor market wants, and you should be able to find a job in the near future. You worked as a bank teller. In recent years, more people use electronic payments instead of cash. Because of this decline in volume, the bank discontinued your position. What type of unemployment are you? In this case, I'd say you're structurally unemployed because your skills are no longer needed for this economy. They don't need people to manually process payments when computers can do it instead. So your job then would be eliminated and you'd have to find new skills in order to get employed again. You work for a clothing manufacturer that has excessive inventory. You have been laid off until things pick up. What type of unemployment do you represent? In this case, you would be cyclical. It's not that people don't need clothes to be manufactured. It's that people aren't buying clothes right now because the economy is slowing down. So your skills are still in need, and they will come back again when demand kicks in and when the economy begins to grow. But for right now, we don't need you. That's the sign of a cyclically unemployed individual. You worked in technical support for a large computer company. The company outsourced this service to a company overseas, so you are out of a job. What type of unemployment are you? Again, you would be structurally unemployed in this case because your skills are no longer needed in this country. I guess if you wanted to move to another country, you could still retain your job. But right here in this economy, your skills are no longer relevant. They are obsolete. You're never going to get a job again as a technical support operator for this company. And because of that, the structure of the economy has changed and you're out of work. You are a carpenter. Business is slow for the contractor you work for and he has had to lay you off until things pick up. What type of unemployment are you? In this case, you're cyclically unemployed. There's always a need for carpenters and builders. It's just that they're not building things right now, but when the economy starts to pick up again, they'll likely hire you back. That's the very essence of being cyclically unemployed. Finally, you completed your medical degree and are deciding between two job offers at a major at major area hospitals. What type of employment are you here? In this case, your skills are desired and wanted, um, and you are likely to get a job here in the near future. So that would leave you as frictionally unemployed, short-term in nature, as you shift from one job to the next. 
Now, when you're unemployed, the government does provide benefits to you and your family in the short term while you look for new work. They're called unemployment benefits. This video explains how unemployment benefits are calculated and what the typical benefits are for people who are out of work. I'll link this in the description to the uh, YouTube video so you can watch it separately. We'll work on some practice in class and uh, there's an assignment that you can work on that will be on Schoology. If you have questions, let me know. See you soon.